Welcome and good evening. My name is Celeste Kramer and I'm the Development Director at Inspire School of Arts and Sciences. Inspire School of Arts and Sciences is a tuition-free public charter high school in Chico, California that specializes in helping students pursue careers in the arts and sciences. Enrollment at Inspire is open and we welcome you and your team to join our family by um, applying at inspirechico.org slash enrollment. Tonight, we are hosting another webinar as part of our Parenting Teens Educational Series, a series of talks and panels aimed at supporting families in taking on challenging topics. Each of these webinars include a one-hour presentation and a Q&A with parents, local experts, or educators. We are covering a range of topics from tonight's session on helping teens engage in constructive social discourse to helping te teens deal with trauma and crisis to fostering a healthy transition from middle school to high school to building positive mental health and more. We are hopeful that this series sheds some light on these issues and makes it easier to start critical conversations with the teens in your life. I'm proud to introduce today's session and speaker. We have Avita North. Um, we, are in a, we are in a challenging moment in history where political division and lack of constructive conversation around the issues facing our communities is difficult to come by. From topics like systematic racism in America to civil unrest to criminal justice and reform to COVID-19 and beyond, the time is right to equip the young people in our lives with the tools that they need to engage on these topics, no matter which side of the issues they may fall on. Tonight's speaker, Avita, and Inspire School of Arts and Sciences um, is Inspire School Arts and Sciences teacher with over seven years of experience facilitating conversations on difficult topics with teens. At Inspire, she regularly brings challenging uh, social and political issues into the classroom so that students can learn in a real time how to express their perspectives in a safe and respectful way. Tonight, she is sharing some of her expertise with you. Avita North, welcome, and thank you for being with us tonight. I'm going to hand this presentation over to you. If anybody has questions, they're more than welcome to put it in the chat or the Q&A, and I'll be monitoring that for you. Okay, thank you, Celeste, and welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for spending the time with us tonight, and I'd love to get started. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and be honest. This is kind of a strange experience. It's, it's similar to teaching students online when you can't see any of their faces, but it, you really hope for and are optimistic that they are there. <laughs> so please feel free to use the chat and interact. Um, so this webinar is titled, How to Help Your Teen Learn Civil Discourse. And in order to accomplish that, I really wanted to focus on a few things. Um, uh, why I'm here, for example, who I am, that's always important when you're trying to engage in contentious or topics that simply matter. Um, and then we're going to take a look at what civil discourse means and discussions I've had with Inspire students about this topic. We're going to take a look at the social and political issues that are really um, troubling for our teens today, especially in this age of social media. Um, next, I'm going to show you a few things um, so that students understand and, and your children understand how to disagree without being disagreeable. I think um, President Biden put it as disagree without disuniting in his uh, inauguration yesterday. Um, and then, of course, how we can create a comfortable, is what one of my um, students said, comfortable space or safe space as we, the parent, would like to, for it to be. Um, so I just put some pictures there on, on kind of why I think this topic is so important, why I'm so passionate about it. Um, I've been teaching at Inspire for the past seven years, and, and I've even done my student teaching here. And I remember starting my student teaching in a time where things were predictable in American politics. Things were predictable and almost boring. The issue was that our kids don't care. They, they don't care, they're not knowledgeable. And now it's entirely different. It's brand new. There's so many passions and opinions and talents and skills that these um, kids, these 
future voters are tapping into. So these are just pictures of um, some of our students at, at rallies or, or walkouts um, regarding climate change and or um, gun policy reform. And so I thought that was really important to highlight them. Okay, so who am I? Um, I have a few roles, of course, um, one of them being the current teacher of the requirement for seniors to take American government and economics. They're stuck with me for the whole year. Um, and of course, we're um, always thinking of how to address the needs of all students. And so I've taken on the role of equity coordinator, um, which is a developing team of staff and teachers that are really trying to take a look at the issues of inclusion and diversity and trying to um, give our own self-reflection on what that means to inspire and how we can really convey and secure that message with our community and stakeholders. So that's my other role. And of course, the one that takes the most time and is why I'm always exhausted. I'm a mama of 2.5 toddlers. I say 2.5 because one of them always has a food baby. I have no idea. It's my daughter on the left. And if you see her little onesie, it says future president, CEO Ninja. And then there's Alden. He's the master of mess. He is an exhausting child. So they're at home screaming with my wife while I get to hang out with you all. That's right. Okay. The other part of me is someone who is incredibly politically um, active. Although I try to exercise things I tell students about media literacy and mental health and that's of course turning off my social media and news media two hours before bed. But of course I, I, um, I pay attention to the things that I think that students will really take to heart. And so today and yesterday we watched the inauguration and I really highlighted um, the words of the poet who was able to, um, to share at inauguration, Amanda Gorman from LA, she's a 23 year old woman. And her words just really echoed with students today. I, sh I shared the video of her speaking and these words that I've highlighted um, in the blue and the red especially, um, I think it really captivates um, audiences and really captures the feelings and um, uncertainty of the students. So it says, we did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it, we found the power to author a new chapter because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. So this, at the end of today, when I showed this clip, it was during check-in, kind of debriefing and really looking at how students were feeling. It's, they were, silent. And I couldn't tell if they didn't know how to react, they didn't know how to openly share, or if they um, were just so moved. And with wait time, it was it was the latter, they were moved, because she, she really touched on what they had just said previously after we watched um, the president's speech. And their reaction to his speech was hopeful, but cautious. And when we looked at, at Amanda Gorman's message, it was cautious, but hopeful. And that, that is how I view the students of Inspire and the teenagers in our community. So we need to do them justice. I did wanna share with you some, some reactions to January 6th, the day that rioters um, and insurrectionists stormed the Capitol and threatened democracy. Um, this was during our American government class. And I just asked them, I gave them the open space to just share what they felt. And of course, we already established civil discourse norms. And I'll share those with you. But I just want you to take a look at how open and how expressive and emotionally intellectual they are. They know how they feel. And when they have the space to, to express those emotions or knowledge, then they feel powerful and then they want to actually um, act. So 
um, I thought one of the most powerful things is when one of my quieter male students, he said, I'm scared. It, it's always so powerful for me when, when a student can, can admit their fears and reservations. And, and the students just agreed. They, they didn't tear him down. They didn't um, make him defend himself or question it. It was just openness. And that was, that's what I want to accomplish when we look at the rest of this. <clears throat> so how can we get our teens to discuss things that matter? And so when we examine the term civil discourse, we have to look at it and not in the the historic or political um, issues of being politically correct, right? This isn't that tension that we've had in political history of being PC. This is more about civility and trying to reach another person. And so in teaching students about civil discourse, I tell them and I show them this resource from Facing History and Ourselves that civil discourse means bringing your mind your heart and your conscience to reflective conversations on topics that matter in ways that allow you to extend your understanding and dialogue with others. It does not mean prioritizing politeness or comfort over getting to the heart of the matter. This is extremely prevalent now in the age of polarization and in the age of um, social movements and progress. So um, sharing such important words with them and and asking them how they feel about it, I think really opened the door for students to open up to me. Um, so in order to get your buy-in as to why, um, you know, maybe you can take my advice or, or just see what we do here, I wanted to share with you what exactly I did in American government the, the past year so far. So, <clears throat> I do have, I want to be honest, and that's, that's exactly the approach I always have with my students is I'm going to be transparent. And this is a reactive um, assignment. This is a reactive activity in which I established social discourse or political discourse norms because two students showed us that we didn't know how to do that. Unfortunately, it was a reactive teaching um, or lesson, but um, it was still impactful and I think almost more so because then we learned from that experience rather than continued the hate or tension. Uh, so I shared with them this quote, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. That's recent Supreme Court Justice past Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, Okay, so in the first step of developing a contract for civility in the classroom, I asked students to look at themselves as an individual. Um, what do they think a contract really means? What binds us together? I have them look at themselves in terms of uh, what this means. I shared that quote that I just had in a previous slide with you all. Um, and it was important that I approach this as, I'm just listening to you. No one else can see this. This is your space. It's not mine, it's your space and it's ours if you choose to share it out with the class. Um, so then students can open themselves up to what they think is acceptable. How have they been hurt? And how have they felt supported? So that they can then share those ideas um, after more thought together. And this next step was kind of creating scenarios of what what hap what would you do if this happened. And I gave them a shared space in which they felt like they can contribute and that they could feel heard, but it was also anonymous, you know, they just put their they put their initials there. But the purpose of this format was that they could see and I would facilitate like, look, you have the same ideas oh, look, we have the same expectations. These are things we have in common, even though sometimes we're so isolated and we feel alone. And it really got them to feel a sense of community. At least that was my goal. Um, and it, sh it allowed them to practice some of those norms early on. 
So then they knew how they could reach others, how they could reach uh, me and my co-teacher, Mr. Holmes, and they could feel safe in the classroom. Um, the next step, of course, was what does a contract actually look like? What Are these just rules? Are they guidelines? Is What's the actual discipline involved? And I left that up to students. We created drafts um, in random groups. We created a simple preamble of what our class expects when it, it comes to discussions, especially about political culture. We wrote different ideas of how we could um, create norms, what things are acceptable and what do we encourage. Credible and verified evidence, their words, not mine. These are all their words and not mine. I just happened to put it all together and, and show them that they know exactly how to facilitate civil discourse. And just giving them that opportunity to share that, um, that knowledge was really um, building student agency. So then we, of course, I, the only thing I put in was the um, discipline plan, frequent violations or intentional disregard of would lead to this, this, and this. And then we all shared the examples of what's unacceptable language and behaviors. And then I expected students to sign it in their own way. So that was how I built class community. Was it effective? Um, I think so, because then students felt heard and seen. They gave me feedback. Students um, would use terms like, I'm going to watch my airtime, or hey, um, don't dominate the conversation, or they're really trying to call each other in and not call each other out if they don't understand something. Um, so that's how I, I can facilitate it in the classroom. Um, and I wanted to bring light some issues that are being faced with those students now that I've spent some time with them. So the social and political issues that are really relevant to civil discourse um, include online harassment. This is an age of media and mass information and almost overstimulation and um, overload. These, these kids are attached to their phones. It's always in their hand or in their pocket. And they're so, they almost become dependent on it for research or for entertainment or for that feeling of connection. Um, and this creates opportunities for different kinds of spaces in which there are no norms. So you have to be able to talk to them and be open about what's happening um, beyond you know, our relationships with them. Of course, they are facing things like online harassment. And we'll take a look at different examples of what that looks like. Uh, there's also the need for digital literacy. How can students or teenagers or children understand or filter out what's real information and credible? And then the other issue is the media echo chamber. Um, this is often reinforced by news media, but also and um, especially amplified by social media, which is what they spend most of their time on. So th this is uh, research from Pew Research Center. And the study says about a fifth of online harassment um, targets ages 18 to 29 say their most recent experience involved physical threats. Um, and this was of course leaning towards the, the age range that I teach, 17 to 18, this is, um, these are things that happen every day, multiple times a day, but we can't see it. We don't, we don't know what to do with it sometimes. There's offensive name calling. There's purposeful embarrassment. They're behind a computer screen or a phone screen and they don't feel like they need to be filtered. Um, and then, of course, it can lead to physical threats, sexual harassment, sustained harassment, and even stalking. Um, these are the examples of how they can do this. Um, and these are the issues in which, or reasons why they felt harassed. They have felt harassed in regards to political views. Um, our, our demographic or the younger demographic of Inspire knowing their political beliefs based on teaching them. Most of them lean moderately liberal or very liberal. 
with a small pocket of conservative students. And um, this is necessary for, for me to be the neutral or um, the all sides teacher when it comes to understanding political views. Um, so it, it's also important to note that our school is very um, attuned to the issues of gender identity. Um, we're looking closer at race relations and ethnicity and trying to reach all communities within our um, county. We're looking at religious affiliation. These, these kids are being teased and harassed for so many different reasons. And a lot of these are intersectional. They could be harassed for multiple reasons, not just one of these. Um, and this is how that harassment is happening or more so where. Um, a lot of kids, I think, are, um, on, are online playing games, right, on their computer, or they're text messaging or on, a, on an app, a lot of them on social media apps like TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram. Um, and then there's those, those students or those teenagers who are on like Reddit or Tumblr or these discussion sites. Um, most of them don't go to their email accounts to, to harass them, at least not in my experience. So there are so many mediums in which they can feel vulnerable. Um, so what can we do about it? And I've done some research for Mayo Clinic. These are some parent tips for social media. Um, and I think one of the most important ones is to talk about it. Talk about your own social media habits. I know that's that's a challenging thing for us to step back and look at ourselves before um, actually discussing, but it's a matter of can I own it if if I'm going to tell them to do this, am I gonna am I going to follow through? And that's the hard part. Um, so while these these points, the air, the arrow points are from Mayo Clinic, these small um, diamonds are are from me. Um, my take on talking about social media is really just listen and invite them to share their values. What kind of beliefs or what kind of interests do they have? Not making a comment on them, just hearing them out, I guess. Um, and then the non-negotiables, those are, that's a necessary conversation. Um, absolutely. And as, as the parent or guardian, that's, that's our responsibility. And I see myself as a guardian of a lot of my students. It's just that relationship of um, of teaching them right from wrong uh, in terms of political and civil discourse. Um, the other thing as a parent is to set reasonable limits. Uh, of course, this can this relates to mental health and emotional stability when when it begins to interfere with sleep, a lot of my students, sometimes they don't sleep until late and they're stuck on their phones <laughs> and they, and they tell me that they have that, that blue light thing on. And I know that's not true or they skip a meal or they don't do my homework. Um, I, I get it. And so one of the tips was to encourage a routine that avoids electronic media use and especially keeping them out of the, the teens bedrooms and the the harder part is modeling and, and following these rules yourself i know i'm i've been addicted to my phone um in terms of political news which is probably the most debilitating thing to my mental health aside from my toddlers <laughs> so um i have to i have to practice it i even tell my students this i th that this is what i do and then when i complain about being tired in the morning they laugh and they're like you were you were looking at cnn and fox news last night weren't you and i was like you're right i'm sorry and um so it's just funny um okay and next step was to monitor accounts i think that's a that's a hard step i'm not a parent of a teenager i'm a parent of a three and a half year old but he doesn't have the only, th the only county he has is Amazon free time, and I have total control about that. So when it comes to talking about a teen and privacy, that's a touchy subject. But of course, it's important to set that boundary and that notion of safety, that they are vulnerable to people taking advantage of them online. What is online is online forever. And actually, if anyone knows that, the students know that because they understand now that big tech is tracking them they're getting a lot of things and they're aware of that 
Um, of course, the most important thing is explaining what's not okay. Uh, the best approach, I think, is to ask your teen what the norm is. What are, what are people doing on social media? What is it for? What do they think is appropriate? And what do they think is safe to share on social media before talking about your own um, biases or preferences? And then, of course, is to encourage one-on-one -on -one contact with friends. This is incredibly important for teens that might be vulnerable to social anxiety disorders. Um, but also encouraging them to reach out to one another, especially during distance learning. Um, that's incredibly helpful. So my approach in this is that I asked a few students that I currently have and I've had in my classes, what do you think about these topics? And so these are direct quotes from them regarding um, how a parent can help their, their kid in terms of social media. Uh, so this is what a student said, listen to what your student is telling you and be there for them. This might seem straightforward, but tell them that you love them. And if they wish to seek some sort of reprimand through the school administration, support them. Sit in on the Zoom meeting, as these are COVID times. Well, yes, your child does need to learn how to be independent and, you ha and how to have these conversations without you. Right now, your child is feeling extremely vulnerable and it's very helpful to have a parental and loving presence. Um, it's important to note that this is a student perspective who was a victim of online harassment. This is a person who knows what those feelings are, and this is exactly what they wanted from their, their parents, that sense of safety. Um, they also admitted kids are super addicted to their phones, um, but it's obvious that social media is either worsening issues your child has had or school is the direct cause. So they understand that they need a break from social media and that you're there to help them have that space. Um, so what I really wanted to do is ask um, teenage parents what the perspective was on that. What keeps us from talking to teenagers about social media? So Avita, can you hear me? Yeah. Since I'm a mom of a teenager, I can speak, I think, for a wide variety of people. I think it's been really hard as a parent of a teenager to, um, with, with COVID, I have felt incredibly guilty in asking them not to be on social media. So I just want to throw that out there that it has been hard, I think, because all of us are feeling like, wow, you know, they can't be with their friends or, you know, I'm keeping them from doing this. It's life is much different. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that is, that is definitely something that comes up. Um, and then just not understanding how I, I, I think it's very difficult for parents my age who grew up without cell phones. We didn't have access to the news that much. You know, it's, it's, I don't really understand how to talk to my teenagers about it um, because I didn't have access to it all the time. And now what worries me about my kids is that they have their own phones. They can, you know, if something is happening and it's really serious in the world, they're often the first ones to find out about it mm -hmm. instead of having that barrier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, okay, I have some time to think about how I'm going to talk to them. No, they, they know what's going on. And um, so that's very different too. So do you think it's a sense of ego sometimes of like, I don't know how to use that. So how can I talk to them? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> And that's something that's not necessarily always tech related too. It's just that sense of I'm, I'm the moral air power authority here. I have to protect you kind of thing. Um, so then how can we overcome that? What's some mindset of having that conversation? Like coming from your own experience, thinking about your son, how do you get yourself in that door of talking about discord, for example? <laughs> Do you know what that is? <laughs> oh boy! See, I'm I'm being put on the, I'm a, I'm on the spot, Avita. <laughs> students do all the time, and it's vulnerable, and it's totally cool. <laughs> um, I don't know if if people 
want to bring stuff up in um, the chat, you're welcome to or ask questions. We could also. Chana says Discord, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and so I don't know is totally fine. <laughs> That's where we are right now. It's like, I have no idea. But the fact that we are already kind of, I'm tired, I'm exhausted by it. <laughs> like, it's so, it's evolving all the time. I have to keep up with the lingo so that students will pay attention to me. Um, I think it's important though that if you're already attending this webinar, you have a positive um, attitude and that you are inviting the conversation. You're willing to learn um, and be wrong and admit things. And that's that's not the next step, really, is that you're already there exercising that skill. Thank you, Celeste. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> OK, so the next um, topic or issue is really the media echo chamber. Um, and this is prevalent with, with the way that big tech works. And I've been talking about that issue with students is that there's no sense of privacy you know in 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 my generation and any generation of understanding the internet now we know that everything is forever that's the underlying thing what's developing now is the sense of there is no privacy on the internet um, there are terms and conditions that we accept that show that they're tracking us so with the big tech companies tracking us, they're targeting ads. They are creating algorithms to only show us the profiles of people that we're liking on Facebook. They're only showing us the people we tend to look at all the time. So then this produces a chamber in which we just solidify our own views um, and it's dangerous. And so Research, according to Social Education Magazine, shows that the large proportion of youth get the news online more than any other age group, and young people are more likely to get their news online than any other platforms, creating a further polarization and um, a dangerous trend because um, research also shows that people who get their news from social media are far less engaged or educated and informed. Um, still, a um, majority of U.S. users, according to Pew Research, 76%, even though we look at the internet now, at least um, the younger generation thinks it's, it's this great tool. We can access multiple sides to the same story. We can do our own research. It's, we have so much access to things. Uh, the majority of social media users still admit that they don't change their views on political or social things just because they saw it on media. And this has continued to decline. They're not, they're not expanding their horizons in terms of point of view. They're just solidifying or are being prone to confirmation bias. They're, they're not really paying attention to the other side because they are not able to see it at this point. Uh, and that's an issue that needs to be aware of. So where do we get our news? Um, I, I get mine. I remember when Facebook news um, was a, a little thing that you can click on the app and that got a lot of flack after election and Russia probing. But um, where do get, students get their news now? Where did we get our news? CBS, NBC, ABC. We thought the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and Washington Post were legitimate news and news sources. We didn't think about the term fake news. It wasn't a thing. They were always credible. And that's no longer the case um, in terms of how people view them. It's definitely a learning curve. Democracy Now, The Intercept. Yeah, thank you for adding those. So, Students know that there is a learning curve, that there is more access to different points of views. We're aware of the, the fact that there are different points of views, but in reality, what are our kids looking at? Here's what students told me. I guess you could say I get my news from Twitter. I'm going to spend some time on YouTube later when I, sh when I showed them something um, current event related. I usually get my news from the first two sources that pop up on Google. Instagram pages, 
It's still biased either way, but on Instagram, IG, I can see multiple biases. Mostly Reddit and me mom, she's always watching the news. So there's our generation watching the news on TV. Um, and then there's our students, our kids, looking at Twitter, YouTube, Google, Instagram, and Reddit, where anybody can post. This is evolving now, of course, in terms of First Amendment protections and the limiting of certain biases by these platforms, but they're still there. And so perhaps the most alarming perspective for me and um, alarming so much as interesting was the student said, truth be told, I don't really like keeping up with the news though it could be a problem with being informed with what's happening around me. But I feel like being involved with the news makes me get all depressed with the world. So I would say none. This is alarming to me as a civics teacher, um, as a voter, uh, and, and I can also empathize. It's so depressing when it's constant. It's not good for your mental health. So when the student tells me they don't pay attention to politics, I get it. And I think we all get it. it. It's exhausting now after this election and you think like, oh, it's it's done, but then it it's not, it, it, it'll just change. Um, and so we need to be aware that this is where this generation's getting their accurate reporting. So what can we do about it? This is what I show students in my American government class is um, some resources online of political bias for the media. And this also includes, um, this especially includes actually not TV, print, or radio content. Um, on the left, you can see all sides. It's an organization that tracks the language used and um, issues covered. And that's how they determine their political bias. That's how they rate that. Um, on the right, you can see a more scientific or data related bias evaluation in which the organization at Fontes Media looks at factual reporting um, and they do a lot of science and statistics in terms of just um, credibility and reliability, like is the information actually true versus all sides is just doing left, right, center. Um, things like that. So I do show this with students um, just so they know because this is where they go to after they see something on Instagram, after they see something on Reddit. Uh, I encourage them in my classes not to just look at moderate views, you know, um, but also see what the left and the right are saying. And that's a practice that we do in our class. We look at the same issue and we try to see how all sides are covering it, essentially. So that's some resource that you can direct your team to. Um, another technique in terms of how your kid can disagree without being disagreeable is teaching them how to call someone in. Right now, what's, what has been really big in the past few years is call out or cancel culture. Um, so they're canceling toxicity of certain certain themes or like toxic masculinity or toxic uh, positivity. So they, they just cancel those things, but they're not actually talking about the issue. Um, so calling in is a technique that's usually used when one person has hurt another. And instead of shaming that person who's made a mistake, um, you ask them questions. Uh, and that's based on that is mutual respect for one another, that you know that you're assuming positive intent is another way to think about it. That we're not out to hurt each other, that the best thing is to teach each other. And so calling in versus calling out is the best way for um, any of us to really try to get over any disagreements. But this does not dismiss the fact that there is non-negotiable intolerant language and behaviors. Um, calling it in will take the root of why this is happening, why that language is used, why that pain is there. Um, 
and that takes a lot of work. Uh, this is something I've had to do in my class in which a student felt that another student was using really triggering language and it, and it became really tense and explosive and this, I needed to isolate the students so they wouldn't talk to each other. It was, this is all via Zoom. But I, I had them eventually talk to each other and confront the problem and call it in and try to understand each other versus just hurting each other. And that takes a lot of work, but it's, it's a good technique and that's from um, teaching tolerance. Okay, and then we're looking at media bias and political socialization. Um, political science has told us that family is the most important agent of political socialization or what our beliefs are. We, we, have, we have thought that we're basically telling them what to believe directly. It's direct transmission of political beliefs, but instead it's, um, it's what they think versus what you think and what you think versus what they think. It's a very adversarial and um, inaccurate image sometimes of expectations versus reality. So how can you get over that? How can you get over what they think you're thinking and what you think they're thinking? Um, teens told me that really the goal is to make us feel heard and not like we're being punished for speaking up because it's really hard to start conversations. The first step is always listening. And the second is recognizing that this is about your child and not about you. And this, this, this is of a, a student who was having like specific personal issues that they were trying to acknowledge with their parent. Um, they also said acknowledgement of their own shortcomings is much more useful than trying to cover up for them. I find that so incredibly important. Um, I'm, I'm pretty transparent about how I'm feeling or what's going on or if I'm present when I start my class. Um, and I do that very deliberately and carefully. So when, when I open myself up like that, it gets the student to listen to me. And I think, of course, you can echo that in parenting as well. Well, that's hard because, you know, there's things we know that they don't. And sometimes you just don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, but of course, the next step is really understanding that this is their world and making them feel like the things online don't matter is hard. You can absolutely think that, right? Like at every point, like my toddler right now, it's the worst, everything's the worst, right? I, he, I didn't put the right green bean on his plate. He wanted this fork versus that fork. All those feelings are crazy to me, but he, the feelings that he's having are still real and it's intense. and. And it doesn't change no matter what the context or the age that we are. Those feelings still matter. So understanding or recognizing that those feelings are real are really important. The other part, of course, is touching in on that idea that they need oh, time away from that space online, that they need to be comfortable at home where they don't have to talk about it or they could talk about it. It's just off media. And that's the hard thing. Uh, and then specifically from American University is this is how to help children navigate controversial topics. This is in terms of if they're asking you about it. Um, the important takeaways were to listen to a child's question. Um, I thought the most important ones is accepting those feelings and perceptions as real to them, right? Echoing that last point remaining objective or keeping your feelings separate. This is something I have to do as a social science teacher. I have my leanings, I have my biases. I tell them that I have those things, but that's not my job and it's not my place at that time to tell them what I believe. Um, and at that time when they're asking you something political, I think the best thing to do is to remain objective and try to just listen at that point. And then the most difficult part is being open to any result after that dialogue. It could be tension, it could be anger, it could be happiness, just accept that it's gonna happen no matter what. Um, and then of course, considering the maturity or that level of empathy, the age range is different. A 14 year old is different than a 17 year old. So some of these techniques are different. Um, and of course, just vocalizing and expressing those feelings. I think the next step of course for teenagers is doing something with those feelings, whether it's 
creating a post or joining a club, getting involved in something where they feel passionate about it. When um, the Parkland shooting happened, my students were devastated. They didn't know what to do. And I, I was devastated. I didn't know what to do. So what did I do? I, I taught them how to write a letter to their representative and I showed them how to look up gun policy and current legislation. And so then when they marched out and walked in protest, they were handing that out and created a template for people to write those kinds of letters. So putting that energy somewhere is powerful to them. Um, I think that was the last slide. If I have any questions. Celeste, are you still there? I am here. And I have to say that um, I love that you said have them do something because I really feel like teenagers feel like things are happening to them and it's very disempowering. So if they're taught how to do, like how to address it, do something about it, it's much more empowering for them um, because it is, it's, it's, it's a, it is a difficult world where you have all this information flying at you <laughs> and then you don't know what to do with it. <laughs> Um, so coming up with that would, is, is, really, would, is really incredible. One of the questions that came up, and I don't know, this is a tough one, so I don't know, Avita, but um, mm -hmm. if your teen doesn't want to talk, how can you have discussion? Which, um, you know, that, that, that is a very that's very very difficult mm -hmm. i once heard that when you especially when you're talking to boys doing something have them do something with their hands and you doing something then they tend to open up a little more a friend of mine since the pandemic started um her and her daughter take a half an hour drive every day and they just talk um, but I don't know if you have more suggestions for that. Yeah, again, that's that doing something with that energy or those emotions. That's really important to externalize what's being heavily internalized because they're getting all this information overload. What can they do? It's one thing to put words to those emotions and those thoughts, but then actually actively doing something about it is more powerful and you're right. Um, but is a question, what do you do if they don't seem like they can talk about it or what to do with that energy? Um, I think it was more their child doesn't really open up to them. So how do they even start a discussion? You know, that's right. And so when I was student teaching and I was trying to figure out what what's going to be different about my teaching than my mentor teacher is teaching. How am I going to get these kids who don't look interested at all to talk about it? And it's a it really um, occurred to me that they know stuff way more than I do or give them credit to, right? So just simply framing the discussion or the conversation of what have you heard about this? Do you know what this is about? Instead of putting it on you, you're putting it on them in, in a way that's not vulnerable and you're not looking for something. It's, have you heard about this? And that's exactly what I do in my class. This, when we talk about something really intense and difficult, like when Parkland happened, I asked, what have you heard about this? What is your initial reaction? Then you can talk about it. Go in the general and not the specific, um, especially if they're not ready. I like that because there's no real emotion behind it. You're just asking, what have you heard? <laughs> have you heard anything? Yeah. Oh, nothing. Okay. Here's what I heard, but, and then what do you think about it? Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily anything more than that. Um, and then the other thing that came up was how to self-regulate to take an information overload break. And I started laughing a little bit because I just had a conversation with my sons and I said, I think we are on our phones too much. And I realized I was looking at my phone when I was bringing that up with them. And I literally had to call myself out and say, and put my phone down and say, that was not okay. Yeah, <laughs> but that so is how addicted we are. <laughs> right. It's so hard. Sometimes I, I think of putting a timer on it. I started doing that, not necessarily a timer, but like a, a time of the day where I wouldn't, like maybe I'll take a walk at noon or 
by seven o'clock, I won't look at, I won't open this app. I'm not going to go on this website. It's just blocked for me. <laughs> um, and that helps. Or like, I'll, instead of doing that, I would say like, I specifically know I'm going to, I'm going to play this game instead. I'm going to do this with my son. Mm-hmm. And it helps to know specifically instead of looking at it as, I know I need to take a break. Just focus on what you want to do instead. Yeah, and probably really trying to find activities where you, it's really even difficult to look at your phone, like playing cards if the, with teenagers or board games. Puzzle, or A puzzle. A puzzle, <laughs> right? And it's, it's a no screen time activity. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I don't think that, let's see. I'm trying to, I'm looking at the questions just to make sure we answered. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, what are some ideas on how to see gray areas and topics instead of all one side or another? Mm-hmm. Are we talking about from the parent perspective or the teenager's perspective? I would imagine the teenager's perspective. I think that that's a really challenging question, especially for for a teenager who is just swiping on their phone. The way that TikTok or the way that Instagram works is just like you're sliding up, you're sliding up, 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 up. And then with the algorithms of being in that bubble of just reinforcement, it's really challenging. So they need to they need to look at other sources um, and. I, and that's where looking at like AP News or Reuters or Axios, those things in the center of that chart um, that are mostly news organizations and not blogs or social media is really important. That's, that's the gray area because you're looking at factual reporting versus commentary. I think having that discussion of what is factual reporting versus what is commentary first is important. Yeah, I, you know, now that you say that, I think I will start asking my sons where, what, what, what source did you hear that from? Yeah. And, and did it say it was opinion or not? Mm -hmm. And teaching them where to recognize that. Yeah. I think making that the norm of where did you hear that from? I, I still like in my classes today, the students will say something very strongly or passionately worded. I'm like, oh, do you have a link for that? It's much easier on Zoom. I'm like, could you share that article with us? That's really, that's a really good topic. Just encouraging the, the, that sharing of information viewpoint versus that defensive, where, where'd you hear that? Mm-hmm. The tone is totally different. Of, could you share that with me versus where'd you hear that? Yes, <laughs> and they will pick up on that. Yeah, tone is everything to teens. And I loved what you said about non-negotiables, and I think that the family needs to talk about that and decide what is non-negotiable, um, and that it's okay to do that. That we're not, and we explain what what is non-negotiable and why. Um, and as soon as you said that, I wrote it down because I want to have a conversation with my sons about that. Because it, and I think it's important to look at that conversation of their non-negotiables and yours. Creating that space of safety and not just comfort, I suppose. Right. Yeah, because they could come up with things that I wouldn't have thought of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we don't know what's on Discord. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, let me see if there's any more questions. Let's see. Discord. I think that might be it. Is there anything else, Evita, that you want to address? I don't think so. I think we covered all of it. I just wanted to open myself up to um, any future emails for questions or Mm -hmm. things like that, comments. I'd love feedback. Um, Or if you want to share that your student has me right now, I'd love that also. Um, well, I really appreciate you doing this and, and, and talking to us about this. This is not an easy topic, and I think I speak for a lot of parents and not understanding even how to address it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think of all the generations, we're worlds away from how we were brought up as far as technology than how our children are being brought up. And I think sometimes that feels 
very isolating as a parent and not really understanding where to start. So I do appreciate you bringing that to our attention and talking that through us, talking through us with it. Um, and then to our participants, you know, I appreciate you joining us. We'll be hosting several more parenting teen webinars this month and early next month. And we hope that you'll join us again. Um, you can always check out our site, inspiredchico.org, and then go to Learning Inspired. And you can see all the lists of uh, webinars that we have coming up. And then again, we do have open enrollment right now in case you know of anybody that is looking for an incredible high school to send their, their student to, we would love to have them. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful night. Thank Bye. You. Bye, Evita. Thank you so Bye. much. Who type answer? I teach seniors. Sorry, this is the last question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> No problem, Anna. Good night. Good night.